The top three stories of the week. Welcome back to All That Jam, where music has new limits. We are back from Mondegreen. We have our three stories, but Amanda, how was your Mondegreen experience? Kevin, it was great. I have nothing to say other than I'm so happy that I was there and I will probably have a lot more to come up with that's much more, you know, sentimental than that after I have time to really process it. But it was awesome. I just was so, so happy uh, the whole time. I thought it was it was great. How about you? I had a good time. I mean, if you've been on Facebook, they've been beating that horse that poor dead horse about this and that that was wrong with it. And I'm thinking, have you ever been to a festival? You know, yes, AEG took over this year. Yes, there were price gouging, it seemed like, with the food and the drinks a little bit. But, I mean, I hung out in my little corner in North GA with some people that I love and hardly saw anybody unless they yeah. ha I happened to run into them walking to and from. But mm -hmm. it, I guess my one knock was from South ga to north ga was like going from florida to maine it seemed like it was so far between the two. i know i know it's so true so kevin actually i i do want to talk about something that you just referenced that's been on my mind and i haven't had a a chance to figure out how to even um approach this so i think the one thing that's emerging to me after being home now for a couple of days is that i prefer my festivals without cell phones Oh, well, here I am. And, and here's what I'm going to say, because you, as you just said so, so well, you know, you spent time with your people where you were loving each other and having fun. And if you ran into someone amazing and I, I had to talk myself out of anxiety, believe it or not, a couple times over the weekend that I wasn't responding. I wasn't um, making enough of an effort in general to mm -hmm. find people or get back in touch with people or be in a certain place at a certain time. Not, I'm not talking about family responsibilities and checking in at home or things that, you know, you knew you were going to be doing. I'm just saying like more of that general stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I made a decision at some point that I could not be ruled by that because it was starting to overtake my ability to just enjoy. And then right. it occurred to me, I've never done a fish festival with the cell phone, and I think I kind of like it that way. You know, uh, I was a lot of the people I was with. Apparently, T-Mobile had issues. I think I'm mm -hmm. on the T-Mobile network, and I didn't have issues. But I'm yeah. very. Uh, I put when I go into those situations, I tend to forget. I tweeted something about you know everybody I met and how cool it was, and I never think to get a picture with someone because I'm never going to be like, here, let me pull my phone out and. <laughs> Me neither. Take a picture. Well, I think we're similar in that way. And I don't know, um, you know, this actually came up just the other day when um, talking with um, the reality check experiment from Philly, who was at Mondo Green. And I, I think I made a comment about, you know, wishing I could have just put my phone in a locker, which you can do mentally, right? Like, you don't, no yeah. one's forcing us. And they said their immediate response is, I can't even imagine that. How would you find someone if you got back from the bathroom and they weren't there? And I'm thinking, that's not my challenge because my people remember what it was like when you didn't have a cell phone right. and you stay there and you say, I'm going to be here and then you're there. And so, right. or or you have another plan, you know, whatever the backup is. Right, so right. I, if I don't catch you, I'll meet you at seven o'clock at right. the Helios Tower. We'll be here, find you there, whatever, right? And so that is the... I guess maybe this is really making me think about um, not generational stuff because I don't want to be that person, but just comfort level. My comfort at the festival increased proportionately the more time my phone was out of my hands and out of my face. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. definitely. <laughs> it's a good thing. So, yeah, I miss things. I, I tell you what, when I got back, one of the first things I saw was great kin died. I guess the mm -hmm. first day I was at the festival, I loved Greg Kin when I was little. The that song Jeopardy, great video on MTV from the early days, I and uh, I, I was like totally missed it. But you know what? The the we don't have many chances in this life to be where we are, and that's that. You know, mm -hmm. and I was walking to get something 
in the fairgrounds one day and I hear my voice, you know, my name called and it's a friend of mine from high school who I used to go see all the fish shows with and all the festivals with, and we keep in touch, you know, here and there, that kind of meeting it's is every, right? Yeah, exactly. And it was beautiful and we hugged and it was great. And then I said, all right, I got to keep going. Awesome. Right. Wonderful stuff. Um, I thought the music was was really good and i have to go back and listen to a few sets in particular but you know i think i was just happy that i had the chance to go and to be there and be in that that environment which to me felt very relaxed honestly the whole time yeah exactly exactly fish fish did okay uh, i, I i'm not i would not give i give it a b solid b you know what okay. that's a really fair Fair thing. To get an A, I mean, you're talking, we're all spending 10 grand. Right, Easy. Right, right. Exactly. I, I just, my, my one last thing, and then we'll get into the top three stories. Musically for me, it felt like a really good three-day fish run with a OK's festival set, but it didn't feel like a fish festival set, if mm. that makes sense. That does make sense. And I think that's come up in different ways and you know, there was some chatter um, amongst people I know about expectations and what what we, it's individuals and maybe a community go into this with, to your point about this being now, you know, at the, at the end of a tour, coming to the end of a tour mm. um, that has seen some incredible moments. And what is it that we expect? I did see... <laughs> Before I took myself off notifications for the Facebook groups for Mondo Green, which I'm very happy I did because I just can't handle that anymore. There was a really interesting post, whether it was um, satirical or not, I, I don't know. But, you know, someone saying, well, with this whole Mondo Green thing, like, why didn't they embrace that more? Why didn't they do more of that? There was some of it. Where was it? And then mm -hmm. someone's response was honestly, it hit home. And it's one of the few I remember, which was, but why do we expect a band to completely reinvent themselves and, and the wheel every t single time they do something? And part of me thought, well, that's because Fish has kind of set it up to where we do expect right. to some degree that. But then on the flip yeah. side, is is it OK for them to to play some solid sets? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have an answer. <laughs> it. it, it remains to be seen i i i feel like you know you should have had like a buffalo bill or something pop up one set should have been a goofy set everything seemed like focused well played you know deliberate song choices and things like that but there was no maca super there was no buffalo bill yeah. there was no something completely goofy you yeah know. yeah that that is a good point because that is very much baked into the essence of all of this is that sense of irreverence and mm -hmm. fun. Um, I mean, and you're in a place with a Ferris wheel right behind you and, you know, the setup of, of all that. Like I, I do, I do see your point there uh, for sure. It seemed like after the ambient set, um, there was a little bit of a shift in I don't know what I would call it. Maybe just some some cohesiveness. I don't know if it was song choices that felt like, okay, we're coming together now in a little bit uh -huh. of a different way. But you know what? I also know that for where I was, my headspace in those moments, um, I'm probably not going to be the greatest judge of of all of that either. You know? Exactly. exactly. We'll just leave it there maybe for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we jump into these top three stories? What you got for us this week? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, this first one, um, Kevin, I think you and I had seen <clears throat> a couple social media posts referencing um, before we left for Mondo Green, but wasn't completely sure what was happening. Um, as we know, Spafford is a, a really great friend of All That Jam. Um, Jordan Fairless, um, bassist, has been on now with us a couple times and really been so giving and, and open in his conversations with us. Um, very recently, within the last week or so, Jordan announced that he's not going to join Spafford for a part of this upcoming fall tour. So he's still planning to be there, but he's not going to be on the road for the entire tour. And the initial post was a little bit um, kind of open-ended, but 
there was an article on Live for Live Music that reminded me um, that earlier this year, there was a car accident that the band um, had been through. And this was um, something I think they were on their way to Columbus. They were rear-ended by another mm-hmm. vehicle. And it was a, it's a pretty substantial um, you know, thing that happened to them. Um, and I know Jordan is not the only person that um, you know has had to kind of make some changes in their their touring schedule. Brian, um, the guitarist Brian Moss, had taken some time um, as well, mentally, physically, to um, to recover as well. So you know, I think it's um, it's a moment that makes me, of course, number one, think about Spafford and and hoping that this time will heal in the ways that it needs to. But also all these bands that we love are on the road, crisscrossing the country all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And it it made me sit back and think a little bit about that. Yeah. It's a hope he's doing okay. Whatever it is getting himself together. And, you know, you said Brian was off Mike from Aquio sat in Mm -hmm. Um, and who is sitting in for Brian. Yeah. So um, Sean Gordon, um, who plays an elephant proof, with Ben Atkins is going to fill in. Yeah. For those dates. Nice. Nice. So yeah, we wish him the best life on the road is hard. And those guys Mm -hmm. are road dogs. They are out there Mm -hmm. all the time. So yeah, let's hope that, uh, the the show when he comes back is going to be special because I think it's been a while since Brian and, uh, Jordan were both on stage together. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that, like you said, you know, it, it is not an easy life for so many reasons. And um, I'm also glad Jordan will have some time with his family, um, his little girl and, you know, and Lizzie and everybody. So we wish him the best. Um, getting into the next story, um, I'm combining a few things into this one under just the general category of learning, learning sciences. Um, so, Kevin, we had talked a little bit um, this spring about the Fish Studies Conference. I think in the past, even prior to that, we have talked about Stanford University's uh, course offerings that cover the music and culture of the Grateful Dead. Um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to share some updates there for people because um, these online courses are available to anyone. Um, and so talk about Stanford. They're offering a new course this fall that's going to be titled did it matter? Does it now? The music and culture of the Grateful Dead, um, who will be um, be taught by David Gans, who has been doing this kind of educational work now for a very long time um, through Stanford. Of course, he's. The- I got an education from him on the Deadhead Hour when I was a teenager in high school in mm-hmm. the '80s. Yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> this is an expansion on a previous offering called Psychedelia and Groove, I think. So, um, you know, eight week course, um, there's gonna be a bunch of guest speakers. Um, There's more information, jambands.com has a great article about this. Um, But, you know, I think that it's an interesting way to really dig into um, appreciation for the roots and kind of the milestones um, of the band's trajectory. And then also thinking about the understanding of the impact that that has had in in many ways on music and culture. So I like the questions though, did it matter, does it now? I like I like that open-endedness. There's no assumptions there. It leaves a lot to interpretation. Right. Now I wonder how quick it fills up. And if it does <laughs> fill up quick, is this something that you can have show up at other universities with other people teaching it or is this something specific to the place where it is the birth of them palo alto is where you know they were born basically and the fact that it's david gans he's an attraction you hear that name you're like i know i'm gonna get something good out of this right yeah absolutely um and i don't you that's a good question you know because it's online technically you could do a lot of different things probably depends on what kind of in learning environment they want um the dates for that uh, class at Stanford online will be October 3rd through December 5th. So the class meetings will be, um, I think, Thursdays in the, the evening time. Mm-hmm. And tuition is under $500 for uh, for the nice. entire semester. Nice. So. nice. I need to do a punk rock college class online. Absolutely. I think you should. I mean, you know, these, are, these little micro learning um, opportunities are great. Plus, 
I'm assuming that there will be a fair amount of um, interaction online between the participants. So I think that is also really fun, you know, too. When I was in, when I was in college, I took a class about the blues and it was the history of the blues from Charlie Paxton and Robert Johnson mm -hmm. through, you know, chess records, all that to the modern day, a couple really good texts, one by a guy named Leroy Jones called blues people that I would suggest okay. anyone reads because it gets into the socioeconomic parts of it. And it was written in the 1960s. So it was fresh in this guy's mm -hmm. mind. He had seen it coming up from the forties and fifties. Um, but yeah, I, that was one of my favorite classes. I showed up every day, even if I was hung over, I got up and went to this guy's <laughs> Well, I mean, and that, that says it all is the motivation. Um, also this fall, this is going to be, um, something a little different. It's a three-part web class series this October um, that is going to be um, run through fish studies. And um, there are going to be different topics for each of those that could include fish and mental health, identity. Um, there might be some listening sessions. Not a ton of information available for that yet, but if anyone's interested, there's a Google form that, um, that you can fill out so that you can get kind of up-to-date information on maybe when you can register, um, that kind of thing. So I love seeing this. I think that this is a, a really great way to give people who are so inclined the opportunity to mm. sit with the music they love in a totally different way. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dig up a link, try to put yes. it in the show notes for you. There. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then last uh, this week, we've got um, a new app that I came across. Um, haven't really been able to check it out uh, too much. Plus, I think this is um, something that's kicking off overseas. Um, it's an app called SESH, S-E-S-H, -E uh, that's been created to address gaps in the music industry, connecting fans and artists, things we hear a lot of. So there's a lot of like corporate kind of jargon in this, um, the press release that I saw. But I think that the the goal is to try to take away the kind of generality and what often, you know, just feels like content made for the masses on social media um, and bring that to an app that is supposed to revitalize um, the way that artists and supporters meet and connect with each other. So I don't know how this is different from something like even, um, how do you pronounce, is it Petrayan? I was I was pronouncing it wrong. Is that I it? call it Patron, and people are like, "That's tequila." <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Um, so um, it's based on the principle of music sessions, it's supposed to be a safe space where you know communities can be built and artists can be rewarded, bands can be recognized. Um, apparently, they've got about two hundred thousand fans on the app so far. Um, it was started in Spain, so it hasn't really hit. I think any no. markets, Kevin, that we are really familiar with. Right, right. I um, something will land mm -hmm. eventually. You know, it was that somebody will find the right combination to make an app like that work. It, I would think that something might work better as a subscription service, which you know <laughs> I hate, but whatever it is, you would pay twenty dollars a month and have access maybe to all of it but then i guess all of a sudden you get into the spotify problems so i mean right. you know I, i've always i guess felt by the record that's always a good way find them on Bandcamp yeah. if they have the physical media spending because i've heard that's worth ten thousand streams mm -hmm. the money yeah. they're going to get off of it right well and you know kevin this is kind of a bigger picture question but as I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm looking at information about this app, which it says, you know, it transforms fans into super fans, promotes direct fan artist interaction. I have to wonder, though, like, is that really where we sh where we should be looking toward? Like, is that something that we should all be striving for? I think part of the challenge in the music community as fans is that there is so much of a perceived like direct connect or that there should be between a, a band and its fans. And so that leads to a lot of people taking things personally or having opinions about things that have nothing to do with them. So I'm almost wondering like an app like this, I get it. And I, I totally love 
the concept, but like, is it promoting a false narrative to begin with that we're supposed to be like really, really in, involved like right. in these artists' life? Like, why? And maybe it's creating something toxic out of it. You know, yeah. you, nobody even knew what Pink Floyd looked like. And you just, you had your Pink Floyd albums, you know? Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of bands, it was like that. But with social media, those walls have been taken down. The thing I worry about on the other side of it, too, is the artist health having to deal with that. I've seen artists on Twitter who, you know, people say negative things about something they did and they really take it personal as opposed to maybe looking at it as someone looking at a larger picture or an overview of your whole, you know, who knows, but it, I, I, they take it personally and famously Trey doesn't read critics stuff because, you know, he couldn't deal I with mean, it. I, I couldn't deal with it. And, and I, and here I am talking 15 minutes ago about the pressure of having a cell right. phone at, right. so I could see friends. Right. Imagine what the pressure might feel like to an artist who then feels I'm going to use the word beholden because I almost mm -hmm. to me that's kind of where it, it can cross over to being available. Like, is that really having something? To show up, right. Yes. Having right. to do these sessions, do the things and say the things and do the pictures and whatever. And it's almost like, has that now become such a mandatory part of being a musician to one degree or another versus like we say all the time the music you know we talk about the business part but there's that like personal piece of it too like a lot of people just don't have that inside of them to give it's just not who they are and and i feel for people even though i have a pretty big battery life for interactions in person right. there's still a point where it's like no like i'm sometimes over you, right, and yeah. sometimes you don't want to mm-hmm yeah, so, yeah, sorry, Sesh. So, I mean, <laughs> so, so, what, what, what we do, it if we decide we don't want to do it, you know, the world's not, you know, not, but if, if somebody was, if we had a thousand people paying us $10 a month, then right. we might feel like we got to kind of keep doing this. It changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. So, so Sesh, thanks for giving us a chance to get a little meta on this, but I, I do think it's an interesting question. Um, yep. I don't see any of that changing, though. That's for sure. Yep, definitely. All right. So next week is Dicks. I guess we'll probably be off next week for Dicks, and then we'll be back the week after that. And until I'm hearing Fish is doing Albany at the end of October, mm -hmm. the week before Halloween for Divided Sky Foundation. But I don't think there's much on the calendar till New Year's. I mean, there's a lot on the calendar, but bigger things that might interrupt what we're doing so continue to, to look for us at this time wherever you find this and remember stay beautiful but don't stay underground too long i'll see you soon amanda thanks kevin <laughs>